Part 1 You will hear a telephone conversation between a woman who wants to attend the cookery class and an official at a tourist information centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, Tourist Information Centre. Mike speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I wanted to find out about cookery classes. I believe there are some one-day classes for tourists. Well, they're open to everyone, but tourists are always welcome. OK, let me give you some details of what's available. There are several classes. One very popular one is at the food studio. OK. They focus on seasonal products, and as well as teaching you how to cook them, they also show you how to choose them. Right, that sounds good. How big are the classes? I'm not sure exactly, but they'll be quite small. And could I get a private lesson there? I think so. Let me check. Yes, they do offer those. Though, in fact, most of the people who attend the classes find it's a nice way of getting to know one another. I suppose it must be, yes. And this company has a special deal for clients where they offer a discount of 20% if you return for a further class. OK, but you said there were several classes. That's right. Another one you might be interested in is Bonds Cookery School. They're quite new. They just opened six months ago, but I've heard good things about them. They concentrate on teaching you to prepare healthy food, and they have quite a lot of specialist staff. So, is that food for people on a diet and things like that? I don't know if I'd be interested in that. Well, I don't think they particularly focus on low-calorie diets or weight loss. It's more to do with recipes that look at specific needs, like including ingredients that will help build up your bones and make them stronger, that sort of thing. I see. Well... I might be interested. I'm not sure. Do they have a website I could check? Yes. Just key in the name of the school. It'll come up. And if you want to know more about them, every Thursday evening they have a lecture at the school. It's free, and you don't need to book or anything. Just turn up at 7.30. And that might give you an idea of whether you want to go to an actual class. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. OK, there's one more place you might be interested in. That's got a rather strange name. It's called the Aretza Centre. That's spelled A-R-R-E-T-S-A. -R -R -E OK. They've got a very good reputation. They do a bit of meat and fish cookery, but they mostly specialise in vegetarian dishes. Right. That's certainly an area I'd like to learn more about. I've got lots of friends who don't eat meat. In fact, I think I might have seen that school today. Is it just by the market? That's right. So they don't have any problem getting their ingredients. They're right next door. And they also offer a special two-hour course in how to use a knife. They cover all the different skills, buying them, sharpening, chopping techniques. It gets booked up quickly, though, so you'd need to check it was available. Right. Well, thank you very much. I'll go and check that out.
That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a fitness manager of a leisure club talking to some new members. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 and 12. Now listen and answer questions 11 and 12. On behalf of LP Clubs, I'd like to welcome you all here today. My name's Sandy Fisher and I'm one of the fitness managers here. Before we start our tour of the club, I'll just run through some basic information about the facilities we have here, including recent improvements, and explain the types of membership available. Our greatest asset is probably our swimming pool, which at 25 metres isn't Olympic-sized, but now we've expanded it to eight lanes, it's much wider. This means there are rarely more than a couple of people at a time in each lane. Unfortunately, there isn't space for an outdoor pool here, but the glass roof on the swimming pool is partly retractable, which means you can enjoy something of the open air experience on warmer days. Our recently refurbished fitness suite has all the latest exercise equipment, including 10 new running machines and a wide range of weight training machines. Each member is given full training in how to operate the equipment and there is always a trainer on duty to offer help and advice. Although we do have adult-only times after six and at certain times at weekends, children are well catered for. Older children continue to benefit from a wide range of tuition, anything from trampolining to yoga. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 13 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 13 to 20. One thing all our members appreciate about us is that we take very good care of them. This starts on day one with your personal assessment. You are asked to fill in a questionnaire giving details of any health problems. One of our personal trainers will then go through this with you. The trainer will then take you through the safety rules for using the equipment in the fitness suite. During your next exercise session, a personal trainer will work with you to make sure you understand these. It's very important to do this because we really do want to avoid having any sports injuries. There's a lot more to looking after yourself than simply lifting weights. At the end of the personal assessment, the trainer will draw up a plan outlining what you should try to achieve within a six-week period. This will then be reviewed at the end of the six weeks. 
Now, I'll just quickly run through the types of membership we have available. All members must pay a joining fee of £90, in addition to the rates for the monthly membership fees. Gold membership entitles you to free entry at all LP clubs. There are now LP clubs in all major cities and towns, so if you travel a lot, this will be a great advantage. Individual gold membership costs £50 a month, and joint membership for you and your partner will cost £75. Premium membership is for professional people whose work commitments make it difficult for them to use the club during the day and so LP gives booking preferences to Premier members at peak times. This means you'll find it easier to book the sessions at times that suit you. Reciprocal arrangements with other LP club are available to Premier members. Premier membership is for individuals only, but you'll be sent passes for guests every month. The monthly fee is £65. You don't have to have any special clothes or equipment when you visit the club. We provide robes and hair dryers in the changing rooms, but it's very important to remember your photo card because you won't be able to get in without it. For people who aren't working during the day, that is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two students called Helen and Jeremy, who are studying creative writing, discussing a project for their course which involves writing and illustrating stories for children. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, Helen. Sorry I'm late. Hi, Jeremy. No problem. Well, we'd better work out where we are on our project, I suppose. Yeah, I've looked at the drawings you've done for my story, The Forest, and I think they're brilliant. They really create the atmosphere I had in mind when I was writing it. Oh, I'm glad you like them. There are just a few suggestions I'd like to make. Go ahead. Now, I'm not sure about the drawing of the cave. It's got trees all around it, which is great, but the drawing's a bit too static, isn't it? Mm. I think it needs some action. Yes, there's nothing happening. Perhaps I should add the boy, Malcolm, isn't it? Mm. He would be walking up to it. Yes, let's have Malcolm in the drawing. Mm. And what about putting in a tiger? The one that he makes friends with a bit later. Maybe it could be sitting under a tree, washing itself. And the tiger stops in the middle of what it's doing when it sees Malcolm walking past. That's a good idea. OK, I'll have a go at that. Then there's the drawing of the crowd of men and women dancing. They're just outside the forest, and there's a lot going on. That's right. You wanted them to be watching a carnival procession, but mm. I thought it would be too crowded. Do you think it works like this? Yes, I like what you've done. The only thing is, could you add Malcolm to it without changing what's already there? Mm. What about having him sitting on the tree trunk on the right of the picture? Yes, that would be fine. And do you want him watching the other people? No, he's been left out of all the fun, so I'd like him to be crying. Mm. That'll contrast nicely with the next picture 
where he's laughing at the clowns in the carnival. Right, I'll do that. And then the drawing of the people ice skating in the forest. Mm, I wasn't too happy with that one. Because they're supposed to be skating on grass, aren't they? That's right, and it's frozen over. At the moment, it doesn't look quite right. Mm, I see what you mean. I'll have another go at that. Mm, and I like the wool hats they're wearing. Maybe you could give each of them a scarf as well? Yeah, that's easy enough. They can be streaming out behind the people to suggest they're skating really fast. Mm, great. Well, that's all on the drawings. Right. So you finish writing your story and I just need to finish illustrating it and my story and your drawings are done. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. So, the next thing is to decide what exactly we need to write about in the report that goes with the stories and how we're going to divide the work. Right, Helen. What do you think about including a section on how we planned the project as a whole, Jeremy? That's probably quite important. Yeah, well, you've had most of the good ideas so far. <laughs> how do you feel about drafting something? Then we can go through it together and discuss it. OK, that seems reasonable. And I could include something on how we came up with the ideas for our two stories, couldn't I? Well, I've started writing something about that, so why don't you do the same and we can include the two things? Right. So what about our interpretation of the stories? Do we need to write about what we think they show, like the value of helping other people, all that sort of thing? That's going to come up later, isn't it? Mm. I think everyone in the class is going to read each other's stories and come up with their own interpretations, which we're going to discuss. Oh, I missed that. So it isn't going to be part of the report at all? No. But we need to write about the illustrations because they're an essential element of children's experience of reading the stories. Mm. It's probably easiest for you to write that section, as you know more about drawing than I do. Maybe, but I find it quite hard to write about. I'd be happier if you did it. OK. So when do you think we can get this done? That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a talk about a project on the wildlife found in city gardens in Britain. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today I'd like to present the findings of our Year 2 project on wildlife found in gardens throughout our city. I'll start by saying something about the background to the project, then talk a little bit about our research techniques, and then indicate some of our interim findings. First of all, how did we choose our topic? 
Well, there are four of us in the group, and one day, while we were discussing a possible focus, two of the group mentioned that they had seen yet more sparrowhawks, one of Britain's most interesting birds of prey, in their own city centre gardens, and wondered why they were turning up in these gardens in great numbers. We were all very engaged by the idea of why wild animals would choose to inhabit a city garden. Why is it so popular with wildlife when the countryside itself is becoming less so? The first thing we did was to establish what proportion of the urban land is taken up by private gardens. We estimated that it was about one-fifth, and this was endorsed by looking at large-scale usage maps in the town land survey office, 24% to be precise. Our own informal discussions with neighbors and friends led us to believe that many garden owners had interesting experiences to relate regarding wild animal sightings. So we decided to survey garden owners from different areas of the city. Just over 100 of them completed a survey once every two weeks for 12 months, ticking off species they had seen from a pro forma list, and adding the names of any rarer ones. Meanwhile, we were doing our own observations in selected gardens throughout the city. We deliberately chose smaller ones because they were by far the most typical in the city. The whole point of the project was to look at the norm, not the exception. Alongside this primary research on urban gardens, we were studying a lot of books about the decline of wild animals in the countryside and thinking of possible causes for this. So what did we find? Well, so much that I just won't have time to tell you about here. If you're interested in reading our more comprehensive findings, we've produced detailed graphic representations on the college website, and of course any of the group would be happy to talk to you about them. Just email us. What we've decided to present today is information about just three species because we felt these gave a good indication of the processes at work in rural and urban settings as a whole. The first species to generate a lot of interesting information was frogs, and there was a clear pattern here. They proliferate where there is suitable water. Garden ponds are on the increase. Rural ponds are disappearing, leading to massive migration to the towns. Hedgehogs are also finding it easier to live in urban areas, this time because their predators are not finding it quite so attractive to leave their rural environment, so hedgehogs have a better survival rate in cities. We had lots of sightings, so... All in all, we had no difficulties with our efforts to count their numbers precisely. Our final species is the finest of bird singers, the song thrush. On the decline in the countryside, they are experiencing a resurgence in urban gardens because these days gardeners are buying lots of different plants, which means there's an extensive range of seeds around, which is what they feed on. Another factor is the provision of nesting places, which is actually better in gardens than the countryside. Hard to believe it, but it's true. Incidentally, we discovered that a massive new survey on song thrushes is about to be launched, so you should keep an eye open for that. Now, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Based on crackles with Rob's website. Did you know that vocabulary accounts for 25% of your total score in IELTS writing and speaking sections? Yes, that's right. This nugget of information underscores the pivotal role vocabulary plays in the IELTS exam. It's not just about knowing a bunch of words, but understanding their usage, nuances, and contexts. A broad and sophisticated vocabulary can make the difference between a good score and a great one.
So, there's no question about it. If you want to ace the IELTS, you need to master your vocabulary. Now, one way to expand your vocabulary is by learning about word families. So, what exactly are word families? Well, a word family is a group of words that share a common base or root. For example, happy, unhappiness, happily, and unhappy all belong to the same word family. They all share the same root word, happy, but have different prefixes or suffixes attached to it. The beauty of word families is that by knowing one root word, you can understand other related words. Let's take the root word happy. If you know that un typically makes a word negative, you can guess that unhappy means not happy. Similarly, happily is an adverb form of happy, and unhappiness is the state of being unhappy. You see, understanding word families can help you predict the meaning of new words, thus expanding your vocabulary. Another crucial aspect of vocabulary that can boost your IELTS score is collocations. Now you might be asking, what exactly are collocations? Well, collocations are groups of words that often go together naturally in a language. For example, in English, we say, make a mistake, not do a mistake. We do homework, not make homework. And we take a shower, not have a shower. These combinations might seem arbitrary, but they're rooted in the way native speakers use the language. Knowing common collocations can significantly improve your fluency and coherence in both speaking and writing. It's not just about knowing a lot of words, it's about knowing how to use them together. When you use words in their common combinations, your language flows more naturally and is easier to understand. By mastering collocations, not only do you sound more natural, but you also enhance your chances of getting a higher score in IELTS. So, how can you improve your understanding of word families and collocations? Well, there are several methods that can help you get the hang of these essential IELTS vocabulary components. One of them is the use of flashcards. By writing down a root word on one side of a flashcard and its word family on the other, you can easily practice and memorize them. Flip through these flashcards regularly, and you'll find yourself recognizing word families with ease. Next, try online quizzes. The internet is a treasure trove of resources where you can test your knowledge on word families and collocations. These quizzes not only make learning fun, but they also provide instant feedback, helping you understand your areas of improvement. Reading widely is another effective method. Diverse reading materials, from novels to newspapers, from scientific journals to blogs, expose you to a plethora of word families and collocations. As you read, make it a habit to note down unfamiliar words and their contexts. This will enhance your vocabulary and comprehension skills. Lastly, incorporate word families and collocations in your daily conversations and writings. This practical application will help you grasp their correct usage and connotations, making your language more natural and fluent. Remember, the key to acing the IELTS is not just knowing a lot of words, but knowing how to use them effectively. So, practice these word families and collocations 